William walked through the mansion and stopped at Kim and Cam's room. He knocked on the door, but it pushed open from even the slightest application of force. There was a virtual orgy of Asian women there, with Kim and Cam thrown in the mix somewhere in the madness. They engaged in their lewd behavior with vigor, as if they didn't know the meaning of shame. I finished your work said William, who ignored this fiasco that was so common to them, it was mundane. As Cam was about to speak, Kim lurched and coughed blood, belching forth a violent stream of red on naked bodies. Take them back to the pens, Kim yelled to William urgently as the little Asian women were spooked like deer. What's going on? William demanded with confusion. Take them to the pens! said Cam, mirroring his sister's words with more force and more urgency. William grew more calm and his face twisted deviously into a smirk. There he formed the inklings of an idea. No, William said defiantly, yet much more calmly than the situation warranted. Kim fell to her knees and blood dropped from her vagina. She touched the crimson liquid in horror. Cam began herding the women out of the room, pushing, shoving. No, not again, Kim said in lament. Help me, Cam urged William. Do what, he shot back. Cam started wrapping Kim in bed sheets. Kim wasn't showing signs of pregnancy moments before, but now her stomach expanded and the force of something inside pushed out, making little dents in her stomach. In a matter of seconds, something pushed out from inside her. Kim birthed it, and it wasn't it. The thing she had given life was an abomination. It was tiny and undersized for the likes of a child. The moment the malformed thing escaped Kim's womb, it bit Cam's hand and scurried away. Close the door, Cam demanded. William ran up and did as his cousin asked. Cam transformed into the half-man form, a monster more man than beast. He turned over furniture to corner the mockery. William growled at the prospect of action. The temptation of a hunt roused his wolf spirit. William cornered the small little broken thing, and Cam scooped it up from behind. Without hesitation, Cam twisted the thing's neck until it snapped. After the grim deed was done, he lovingly wrapped the thing in bed sheets then handed the grim burden to William. Bury it, seeing as you wanted to be involved, Cam said. William looked at the ghastly bundle. I think I'm done running errands for you. If Ilse knew about this, and with how casual you are about this, I'm sure that you've done this before. No, I don't think you're ever going to tell me what to do ever again. William said with confidence that he was no longer beholden to them, even though they were technically his elders. William walked out of Kim and Cam's bedchamber, unburdened by responsibility. In the dining hall, William smiled at Cam, and in that moment, they locked eyes. He reminded him why he wasn't going to challenge him. I don't think we need to doubt my loyalties to the pack, do I? William said to Cam smugly. Cam smiled and nodded, as if he had wholeheartedly received the message. William turned back to Ilse. You can't stop me from seeing him. I'm Alpha until Father returns, commanded Ilse. But not Alpha. Walk softly, interjected Lord Bristol in a condescending whisper. Floor stood up, as if he'd level William if Ilse commanded it. The other family members all stood to show solidarity to Ilse's decree. Fine, William said with dejection. He threw down his dinner napkin into his plate and left. William needed some air. How could you fix the problem if you couldn't diagnose the problem? He noticed Datara outside as well, as if she too were cooling off from her disagreeable incident. She spoke in hushed tones, but William didn't share her need for conspiracy. So you think Ilsa is going too far? Atara asked. Yes, but before you go on your tirade, I think the extent she's prepared to go to is uncalled for. That is all, William said as a preface, because he knew she was always going to side on the opinion that any death was too much death. I had such high hopes for you, Atara said in lament. 
When he had first been accepted into the family, she had hoped that he would be different, that he would be the one to tip the balance of the pack back to equilibrium, but she now felt he was slowly becoming as amoral as the rest. Don't, because I was never like you. Just because I didn't see you killed doesn't mean we were co-collaborators, said William. I was in no danger of being killed, and you and I both know that it wouldn't allow me to die, so you saved me from pain. Only someone with a good heart takes someone suffering as their own. Don't presume to know me. If I don't, who will? Atara snuck into the pens. Floor slept on a bed of hay near the cows. Slowly and deliberately, she ignored the animal captives and focused her attentions on the human cattle. She pulled away a massive lock and opened a pen which held five captive women of Asian descent. She put a quiet finger to her lips to calm them and to show she was not with them. The women followed Atara as she shepherded them to the forest. They spoke in their own language to one another in hushed tones. Go, run, Atara said while animating her arms to accentuate the point. Those that may not have understood her words could surely discern the intent. Tara's eyes became big and her hair began to grow. Her voice rumbled deep and monstrous before she spoke again. Go! This time, there was absolutely no confusion, and the women fled like scared rabbits darting in different directions. Tara became a huge, monstrous, light brown wolf. She scurried up a tree as easily as a vertical floor. Other monsters emerged of various colors and sizes. Atara noted Corona the White Wolf. Ulik's tattoo shone through on his face even after the change and was visible. The pack of wolves slowed and sniffed the air to renew the hunt. Atara's anger grew and so too did her size. She violently dropped from the tree, a wolf beast built for destruction and carnage over speed and the hunt. The biggest wolf of the four made a transformation and became bigger still, and though Atara had the advantage of fury and surprise, they had the advantage of numbers and obvious size. The biggest of the four was a brown wolf who clamped down on Atara's neck. It held her there with no intentions of stopping. William relaxed and eased into the transformation of man so he could speak in the human tongue. He stopped in a form in between both worlds then said in a harsh, monstrous voice, She is necessary, fool. You cannot finish her. The big wolf did not relent. His murderous eyes seemed to hardly care. I will fight you, Floor, said William. The massive war wolf stared at William, then released her, not necessarily because he cared for her life, but because he found a challenge that he liked better. The white wolf transformed into Corona and she just watched the exchange. When the focus was on William and Flora, Corona used that opportunity to kick dirt in Atara's face. She was stolen for the others. Bring them back. Unharmed. William said, attempting to use simple logic that a simple man could easily comprehend. Flora, from the shell of his wolf form, paced around William, as if not sure if he were going to tear him apart or consider his rather logical conclusion. But in the end, his common sense won out, this time, and Flora charged off into the woods to retrieve his lost sheep. Corona didn't bother speaking. She just transformed into a mundane white wolf and ran after Flora. William's anger boiled over as he turned to Atara. Why do you keep doing this? One day Floor won't stop, he said. Atara shifted back into a woman, then picked up what little clothes she had left on the ground. Why? Because it's not right, she said simply but passionately. We are apex predators, part of the circle. What do you not understand? Not like this. There is no need for this. Obviously it is. If you don't understand why killing for sport is wrong, we have nothing to speak of. This is for survival. He needs this. We need them to live the life that we are accustomed. So you kill to maintain the status quo? If nature is the status quo, yes. Do not hate me. Hate nature. They are a part of us. You kill your own kind when you kill them. Those are not my people. You are no better than any of them. Never attempt to relate to me anymore. You and I are not the same species as far as I'm concerned.